All right, everybody. Well, welcome to our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Uh, real quick, um, just some quick instructions. If you're new or need an update, there have been some changes to the uh, setup here. Um, the audio uh, can be found at the audio at the top or now a little button at the bottom that um, either has a phone or a headset icon on it. Go ahead and click on that. Um, and then from there you can choose voice over internet, which tends to work the best, or you can call the phone number on there as well. Um, if at any time during the session you lose audio, feel free to head back to that tab. You can just refresh your connection. That usually eliminates most of the issues. If that doesn't work, try switching between VoIP or phone. And if that doesn't work, just log out of WebEx, log back in. That'll eliminate 99% of your problems. Um, down at the bottom now is that little bubble in green is the questions tab, Q&A tab. Go ahead and click that. And as you have questions, just put them in right away. You won't be bothering us. Um, we're going to try to do most of the questions at the end. But again, um, we'll take them at the order that they come in. So please just put them in you know, as, you, as you have them. And, and again, it won't be, it won't be um, you know, bothering us. We'll get to it um, likely at the end, but maybe during the session. Um, Mark Messenger at WebEx.com as safe. Uh, check your spam if you don't see it. That's where you'll be getting your follow-up certificate. And then there'll be a link to the survey in there. That same survey will pop up at the end when we close the session out. Please take it. Even if you don't need CUs, we definitely want to get your feedback. Um, coming up next week, we're going to continue our conversation uh, with Ducks on introduction to fully ducted heat pumps for all electric heating and cooling. Um, and then following that, we're going to be talking about a guide a user-friendly guide to energy-efficient, healthy, uh, locally-made products. Um, very cool thing over there. Uh, and then we're going to be doing something unique. Where we're going to be working with realtors. So get all your realtor and appraiser uh, friends gathered up, and we're going to be doing a full three-hour session on helping them help you sell high-performance homes. And then we got a lot of other sessions coming up this year, so make sure to check our event page. And then also Early Bird um, for Better Buildings, Better Business ends December 10th. If you're a member of ours, um, by November 10th, you can sign up and enter in and win a free ticket or get a discount. So make sure you're signed up um, for Better Buildings, Better Business, February 13th in the Dells. This is a national, it's in Wisconsin, but this is a national conference. So head on out there. And then uh, become a member, support our mission, get instant registration, discounts on courses, certification, and all of that. Uh, this course today is approved um, for all of our normal CUs, uh, BPI, non-whole house, NARI, AIBD. Uh, and this specifically is going to be approved for lead accredited professional in homes, and as well as AIA health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. And this course is brought to you by the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. And today I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here. And uh, what we're really going to be talking about is getting better flow um, through better duct design. And that's going to be the, uh, the focus of today's t uh, course. And with us today is uh, Ty Newell. He's the co-owner and co-founder of Build Equinox, a company devoted to inventing technologies for healthy, comfortable, and sustainable living. He uh, retired from the University of Illinois in 2007 as the assistant dean in the College of Engineering, having advised 70 masters and doctoral graduate students and he's an emeritus professor of mechanical engineering. Uh, so with that, Ty, um, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Uh, thank you to the Green Home Institute for, for hosting this webinar. And uh, I appreciate all the attendees who are, um, who are online. Um, and I do hope you'll fill out the evaluations. Even though I'm old and rapidly becoming decrepit, uh, I still retain hope that I can improve. And any guidance and feedback from you is much appreciated, as well as on the material we cover today. This is new material that we've just recently been putting together. And, um, and so any guidance from you to make it better, more effective, uh, more understandable is appreciated. So we're going to talk about duct optimization and performance and specifically related to ventilation systems, fresh air systems, as opposed to say larger uh, uh, central air conditioning systems. But a lot of this applies to 
any type of duct uh, system for moving air throughout a, a home or a building. As far as uh, who I am, where I'm located, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm in central Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And as uh, Brett mentioned, I'm retired from the University of Illinois. And uh, my partners in crime are Ben Newell, who is president of Build Equinox, and Alex Long, who is a vice president. And the three of us form what we call Build Equinox. And we, uh, as far as our backgrounds, we're all mechanical engineers, but our uh, driving mission is to improve our health, comfort, and, uh, and to do that in a sustainable manner. Uh, basically, in the words of Aldo Leopold, um, uh, how do we live on a piece of land without spoiling it? So we, we manufacture something we call a serve, uh, a fresh air, a smart fresh air ventilator. Uh, while I won't go into detail on it, uh, you'll find uh, plenty of webinar and background materials on our website. But basically, it's a, a, a ventilator that is sampling carbon dioxide and volatile organic compounds and bringing in air when you need it at a level, at a flow rate that you need it and not bringing it in when you don't. Uh, but it's a very technically advanced uh, fresh air ventilation system that will link into other systems and play nicely. Uh, this one picture on the left is actually our uh, first generation serve unit shown on the floor in, uh, this is in a high performance home located in Vermont, something called a Vermont uh, system. And, uh, and we link into uh, various types of mini splits or heat pump water heaters, as you see on the right. Uh, so that we can coordinate our activities. We also link into various types of uh, central and distributed systems, such as this uh, Mitsubishi uh, uh, ductless mini split, but as well uh, ducted mini splits. And this era of low temperature, high performance um, air source heat pumps has just opened up a whole new range of capabilities for how we distribute comfort in an energy efficient manner in homes. And, uh, and on the geo side, um, uh, we uh, have hybrid configurations where our GeoBoost heat exchanger will link in, for example, with a geo loop that might be uh, also connected to a larger um, central geothermal uh, conditioning system, such as a geo comfort. And again, you'll find more information on our website, as well as some additional webinar and uh, report materials on, on these. And if you're going to Green Build in Chicago in the next couple of weeks, uh, look us up. We're over in the Healthy Home section, um, and uh, we'll be there. Uh, Serve 2 will be there. And uh, we hope to answer any questions that you might have, as well as let you kick the tires and see what this thing is about. So let's get on to today's topic, um, duck work. Uh, one of our missions is trying to get people to not leave duck work as an afterthought, something that you just kind of mark down where maybe there's some suggested locations of registers, but to more consciously put in a design effort to put duck work in so it's aesthetically pleasing, put duck work in so it's effective, put duct work in so that it's not leaky. And uh, the importance of it, the cost of it relative to its benefits, um, it's just screaming to be moved up on top of your design list or the things you're following in the field, or if you're a homeowner, the things that you should be very concerned about. We just see too many examples of insufficient ductwork, poorly installed ductwork. And, and the end result is that you're not getting enough fresh air. Um, you're not going to be healthy. You're not going to be sleeping as well. You're not going to have as high of cognitive performance as you could have. You're going to get sick more often. And so uh, uh, these are many of the reasons why it's just essential 
uh, whether you're in a leaky home as well as a highly sealed home to have adequate fresh air brought in. Today's ventilation standards that some of you may be familiar with, ASHRAE 62.1 for commercial buildings, 62.2 for residences, roughly states that you bring in about 20 cubic feet per minute per person of airflow. This isn't sufficient, it's just a minimum standard and these standards, as any of the committee members will tell you, are not adequate, that this is an odor-based standard. But the level at which truly healthy air uh, uh, is delivered to a home is more in the range of 40 cubic feet per minute or greater, depending on your health sensitivities. This means that every building should have about two tons of air, fresh air brought into the building per person per day. Um, so uh, if you're in your home 24 seven, you need two tons of air brought in every day. If you're in your home half the day, you need about uh, uh, one ton, but it needs to be delivered when you're there. And the payback in human productivity and health is a hundred times the extra energy cost that's associated with this 40 to 40 CFM per person as opposed to 20 CFM. And you, uh, uh, to find quantitative information, you can find these links on our website with links to Harvard School of Public Health uh, publications that, that look at human cognitive performance uh, as well as sick days associated with poor ventilation levels. So that's the motivation uh, to stay healthy in our buildings. And we've paid a, a significant price over the years of sealing up buildings and then not having effective ventilation in terms of our health, things like doubling of asthma prevalence and um, uh, allergies and, and other things related to uh, the environmental quality around us. Details uh, beyond this webinar, uh, some handout materials, these two reports that are posted on our website and that Brett has available for you that uh, uh, go into these to find the actual details, experimental data, uh, computational data, uh, where we can't go into that level of detail here and it's not intended to uh, really hopefully to give you some sense of direction and to pique your interest in, in this area. Uh, in addition, material that's also posted, the performance and leakage tests that, uh, that we suggest running, um, you'll find more detail and steps on how to conduct those tests in handout materials. But basically, uh, two simple scales, and we'll talk about these scales in this talk. If you get up above 500 or 1,000 as far as ventilation performance, that's a good system for ensuring that you can move in the quantity of fresh air that's typical, typically needed for a residence. And on the leakage side, that uh, uh, the same type of scale uh, and a similar type of test that would be performed, that you want that number to be below 60 or 40 in order to ensure that air is getting where you'd like it to get. So, and, and just again to emphasize, uh, hopefully instead of thinking of ducks, and, and for sure, not every duck should be exposed or viewed depending on the aesthetics and the design style, but, but as much as you can, uh, you know, celebrate ducks, this beautiful mid-century modern that has uh, nice spiral ducts in distributing fresh air throughout its space. Um, you know, as much as you can, uh, put ducts out and, uh, and use them to get air where you need it. As far as duct optimization, our first part of our talk, the second part we'll talk about duct system performance. I'm not talking about anything new. In fact, it's older than 100 years. Uh, this page out of fan engineering, the uh, HVAC uh, Bible uh, for engineers. Back in 1913, people were writing about this. Um, this page happens to show some relations that were derived by a fellow named Frederick Busey, 
who was actually a University of Illinois graduate and worked at our experiment station, and Willis Carrier uh, of uh, Carrier Corporation fame, and who also happened to be the editor of this um, of this design book. They knew back then that uh, the optimal duct system should be a balance of the operation costs and the duct insulation costs. And if you look at the costs that they had in this first edition, which is actually a book I own from 1914, you'll find that the cost of energy and the cost of steel duct back at that time, accounting for inflation isn't all that much different than it is now. And that basically means that as you look at this balance of duct cost and, and operation costs, energy costs, that you come up with similar sized ducts now as you would back at that time. We're going to avoid the mathematics. What we really want to do is talk about the conceptual. And, um, and what that means is that for those of you who are experienced duct designers, uh, in those reports, you can look up all the uh, background and mathematical relations that uh, these results are based on. But for those of you who are not experienced in it and, uh, and don't have any interest in being experienced in it, that conceptually you'll understand uh, as well as gain some tools for, for assessing someone else's design to see if what's going into a home of interest is going to uh, looks appropriate. We're first going to start with a single length of duct. While this is the simplest piece of a duct network, it, uh, it has all the characteristics of a very complex network of duct. And, uh, and we'll see how we go from a single length of duct to a network. And again, without adding in any uh, complications, but all the characteristics that are true of the single length of duct are true of all the other elements like dampers and uh, branches and, and the other items that you might add into an overall complex uh, of duct components. In order to optimize, economically optimize a duct system, the two primary elements of that optimization uh, are the installation and energy costs. Over the lifetime of the system, you might also add in things like uh, replacement costs for components that might wear out over time, um, like a, a damper or a grill. Uh, you might add in cleaning costs, um, repair costs of various sorts over its lifetime. But really the two dominant ones um, are the insulation costs and then the, uh, the energy costs. And there's two, Characteristic curves, I'll see if I can highlight these a little better, but as far as installation costs, for the most part, if we look at installation costs relative to the size based on diameter of the duct, uh, we see a fairly linear increase in costs as the duct diameter gets large. And at some point, if the duct diameter were zero, there's a fixed cost associated with whoever's installing the, the duct, just showing up and setting things up and putting hangers in and other things. And uh, a good estimate of duct costs, but these may vary where you are depending on, um, are you spending $100 per hour for the trades or $50 per hour for the trade labor for installing ducts or are you installing it for free? But somewhere in the range of about $16 a foot and then maybe about a buck and a half, a dollar sixty per inch of diameter per foot length of duct. So if I were putting in 10 inch duct, 10 inch diameter times a uh, dollar sixty, that says the duct's gonna cost me about $32 per foot. And as the diameter increases, that's going to go up in a linear manner. If I'm putting in 100 feet of duct, my duct system, uh, say 50 feet of supply, 50 feet of return, my duct system will cost about $3,200. And that's roughly in the range of what we see, at least in our area, and maybe more, maybe less where you are, depending on, again, those installation costs. On the energy side, energy is related to 
the diameter to almost the fifth power. So uh, the, the cost of energy and other factors that go into the energy costs divided by the diameter to the fifth power. What this means is that the smaller diameter, as you divide a small number into this, whatever this factor is, and as you take that small diameter and raise it to the fifth power, as you reduce the size of the duct, this cost of energy just goes sky high. So over a hundred year period with about 12 cents per kilowatt hour electric cost for running a fan. And we'll talk a little bit more about the factors that go into those costs. But if we wanted to put 150 CFM through a hundred feet of duct, that's four inches in diameter, that I'm going to spend about $12,000, $13,000 over its lifetime. If I increase that to eight inches in diameter, I drop down by a factor of 30 to less than $500 over the course of the lifetime. And, um, and so somewhere in the middle, this cost relative to the installation cost of ductwork is where an optimum is going to exist. This slide shows that more directly. So thinking of uh, duct flows in the range of what we need for proper ventilation of a home, fresh air ventilation, somewhere between 150 to 300, uh, where you may be looking at with ASHRAE 62.2 and their, their design table flows of about 60 to 80 CFM. Again, those are base level flows. Those are not going to be flows that keep you healthy. You need to get up to about 150 CFM for typical occupancy in a typical home. And those needs are going to be increasing both in terms of localized venting, say from your kitchen hood or from bathroom venting, as well as where things are going to be going over 100 years as we increase outdoor CO2 levels from currently at 400 and over the next century, we will be hitting about 600 parts per million uh, CO2 concentration. More fresh air is going to be needed inside a home to keep CO2 levels contained. Over my lifetime, since I was born in the early 1950s until now, CO2 has increased from 300 ppm to 400 ppm. Back in the 1950s with the level of ceiling in a home, leaky home, the indoor CO2 was around 400 ppm. Now outside is 400 ppm. And as we've sealed up homes, we're seeing CO2 in excess of 2000 ppm in homes. And it's just not healthy. And we need ventilation levels in this range over the next several decades in order to keep a healthy in indoor environment. Well, when we look at the costs, the life cycle costs, the sum of the installation costs and the energy costs, when we add those together, we get a curve that looks like this. At 150 CFM, the optimum, the lowest sum of those costs is at about nine inches of duct diameter. Now you'll notice that this is a fairly flat optimum. I could say go down to seven inches and I'm just talking maybe tens of dollars, maybe a hundred dollars of difference if I did seven inches versus nine inches. And for sure that's okay. A seven inch duct is, uh, and maybe even a six inch duct is easier to hide or, or integrate into a design. But just think about if I put in that seven inch duct and today I'm running 150 CFM, but somebody comes along 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and they're saying, you know, I'd really like to push 300 CFM through to keep the air fresh in this house. I've automatically relegated them to uh, assuming energy costs don't escalate relative to, to other things to uh, adding an extra almost $6,000, $7,000 on top of that life cycle cost. 
because of the increase of energy and the increased cost of that over the lifetime, if instead I had put in the optimum about a nine inch diameter duct, I would have only increased by about $1,500 rather than about $6,000. $6, now, admittedly, over 100 years, $6,000, you know, we're not talking a lot of money per year, but it is what is economically optimum, and, and we do start seeing less flexibility for someone in the future. And we need to take our responsibility seriously when we're designing a home today or retrofitting a home today that we are talking about probably at least five generations, if not 10 generations of, of families and people living in this home. So we're making decisions for people well beyond us as we design the home. If we prepare this home for 300 CFM from the get-go, our optimum would shift over to maybe 11, 12 inch diameter duct. And, um, and really, we're only adding maybe about $500 relative to the optimum for a system that's optimized for 150 CFM. And, uh, and so we, if we can figure out how to get 12 inches of duct, or maybe these are two branches of eight inches, um, that we can have this home prepared to be economically optimized for now as well as one that might allow somebody to go even further in the future without excessive costs. This just shows a bit more of the detail of what's added as far as the energy cost curve over the lifetime of the system and the duct installation costs. So this energy cost for 300 CFM plus this uh, duct cost is what's added to give me this, this optimal duct. And the same for 200 CFM, its energy costs and its duct costs, and then three, uh, 150 CFM. But in each of these cases, as I get down to a duct that's too small in size for that flow, the energy just takes off as we have this one to the, one over the diameter to the fifth type scaling factor kicking in. These are all for 100 feet of duct, and they all assume a 100-year lifetime, which thinking of a house as typically having a 100-year lifetime, and, uh, and then 12 cents per kilowatt hour for energy costs. We'll look at the sensitivity to these costs that I'm assuming, uh, but again, I feel these are very good uh, metrics to use especially if you don't know the metrics in your local area to get your uh, bearings. And then as you do gain more information um, and data about your specific costs that you uh, can look at how things might vary from there. But, but we'll look at that sensitivity to these factors that I've assumed. Also built in is that the fan that's blowing air through this duct system, it's 20% efficient which sounds pretty crappy, but it's actually a very, very good fan with today's technology. This would be an ECM fan or, or uh, a very efficient uh, motor of other types. And, and basically uh, for a fan of this level, a uh, few hundred CFM, a uh, fractional horsepower type fan, this would be roughly a 40 to 50% motor efficiency coupled to a fan blade that's 40 to 50% efficient for a combined overall efficiency of 20%. Now, ASHRAE has a very nice journal article uh, that came out about a year ago about fan efficiencies and, and also a pathway for trying to double this over the next maybe 10, 20 years to a 40% combined efficiency, but you're not going to find these on the market at this time at a reasonable cost. So this is a very good number for a very good, say, variable speed ECM type fan. And then this cost as far as um, the cost, the installation cost. What, uh, what this curve shows, out of the uh, previous slide, 
these optimal points, these lowest life cycle costs, it turns out that when you do the analysis, it takes a little bit of calculus, but you find that where the minimum, where the bottom of this life cycle cost occurs, you find a relation that shows that the optimal duct diameter is only a function of the airflow. It's not a function of the length of the duct. So if you tell me that you want to run 200 CFM of air through a length of duct, whether it's 10 feet or 100 feet, I'll tell you that the economic optimum duct will be nine to 10 inch diameter. If you tell me you want to put 50 feet of duct through it, I'll tell you, well, that would be a four inch diameter duct, regardless of that being 10 feet or 100 feet. Now it has built in these cost factors and in the next slide, we'll look at that variation. But here's another very important characteristic that comes out of this optimal duct diameter uh, relation. And that's that the velocity in an economically optimized duct is roughly constant. So whether I'm trying to put four to 500 uh, CFM through the duct or 50 CFM, I'm somewhere between 300 and 400 feet per minute. And on average, you might say 350 feet per minute. And this is a very important conclusion because in a very simple manner then, I can say in residential ventilation duct, if you size that for about 350 feet per minute, say plus or minus 50 feet per minute, that duct is going to be nicely optimized and in addition, as you look through handbooks like fan engineering, which is still available today after 100 years, as well as ASHRAE design and other design guidelines, within a residential environment, they'll typically tell you to keep the velocity below six to 700 feet per minute in order to avoid excessive noise. In today's highly sealed, highly insulated homes, um, everyone I know of that's moved into a home like this hears more noise that they didn't used to hear in their older leaky home. They can hear the refrigerator now as quiet as today's refrigerators are. So you hear more and what that means is that getting lower and lower velocities in order to get further away from duck noise people can hear that sizing ducts in this range is going to also help ensure that people are not going to hear airflow noise to the duct system. And um, duct noise goes with the square of the duct velocity. So uh, a duct that has 400 feet per minute versus 800 feet per minute has about a quarter of the noise power or noise generation as a duct up here. So it rapidly drops off. And so there's some nice benefits trying to get a design that will fit this parameter. Looking at, uh, at a range of cost variations in energy, cost variations in installation costs and fan performance, relative to what I use as a base cost, if I made, um, if I made energy half as expensive or made the duct twice as expensive relative to the energy. So let's say I put in a 40% fan, which effectively cuts in half the amount of energy I need to push air through a duct system and effectively causes the energy to be half as expensive. Or if I said, okay, this house is only going to last 50 years rather than 100 years. So I'm going to make the ducts in effect twice as expensive, or I just say installation labor and the cost of duct is twice as expensive relative to the energy. The effect of doubling the price of installation of duct relative to energy over this range of flows of interest for ventilation design is only about an inch in diameter different. So it's not a huge change of the duct design that I'm going to be selecting. And even with that doubling or halving of those costs, 
I'm going to be moving into a range of velocities that still stays below this noise limit, nice, has a nice cushion, and I'd be designing duck in, say, the four to 500 feet per minute range. Now, if I combined all of these, I said it's only going to last 50 years, which means my duck per year life, my duck installation cost has doubled. And I put in a fan that's twice, a fan motor that's twice as efficient. So I cut my energy costs in half. And I said the labor to install the duct work is doubled. So overall, a factor of eight different from, from this base case. I'm still only changing the diameter of that duct by maybe two to three inches over a broad range of air flows. So uh, there's not a lot of sensitivity relative to this cost and lifetime that's assumed here. And I feel this really is a good reference range for you to use, as well as this conclusion that sizing ducts so that you have 300 to 400 feet per minute of velocity, you're going to minimize callbacks, you're going to minimize uh, occupant annoyance with noise, as well as uh, significantly reduce the amount of power needed to push air through that duct. So let's look at a simple example and just see how we can apply this without having to do detailed duct analysis such as manual D or one of the ASHRAE methods. So this is where hopefully for those of you that are not skilled in duct design but want to know uh, how to assess whether a duct design is good or not can use these simple results. Let's say we have 300 CFM flowing through a main branch. We're going to divide it up into branches with 50 CFM and one that has 100 CFM. And, uh, and uh, as far as these, um, let's say we have 50 feet of this main branch, 15 feet for these distributor branches. With that optimal duct diameter flow chart, I can size this duct system. And again, our purpose isn't to do duct design here, but if somebody's already designed it, I can go through and check that. I can check each section of that duct with that chart in a very simple manner. And then I can also use those relations to look at the duct costs and the uh, duct energy, the energy costs as well as the duct installation costs. Now this is a first cut, but it's very, very close. And we'll follow that up with just showing where those answers would be. But this optimal duct diameter chart for the 300 CFM branch, and remember that that optimal duct diameter doesn't depend on how long it is. If I need 300 CFM through a duct, well, optimally that should be a 12 inch duct. And yes, if, if I really can't fit that in, maybe 10 inches is okay just knowing that that's gonna be a pretty good sized duct then if I'm running say 150 CFM through, uh, but I wanna leave some cushion for getting to 300. Um, but just using this chart, I would hope for something in the range of about 12 inch diameter duct for that main branch. The one distrib distributor branch with 100 CFM, I would optimally put in seven inches, but yeah, I might cheat to six, but if I've got the room, why not eight? It's not going to change the cost too much. And then over on the 50 uh, CFM branches, I'm going to put in about five inch, regardless of the links. This 300 to 400 feet per minute, if I just said, okay, on average, my duck should have about 350 feet per minute. I can also, with a very simple calculation, figure out that area because I just divide this airflow, the CFM desired, by the feet per minute. And that tells me the, the cross-sectional area of the duct, which could either be a four inch by five inch rectangular duct, or it might be a five inch round duct. So very simple tool to check a design somebody might come up with, as well as in the field, taking a look at uh, what might be an optimally uh, an optimal flow for that duct that you're looking at. This is a, just an Excel chart and the details of these calculations, all the relations are in those reports and they're put in in a manner so all the unit conversions are done 
so that you could make up a chart like this yourself, uh, an Excel chart, to do these computations. But basically, with the assumed duct per length cost, uh, the length of the ducts, the diameter, uh, the flow rates, and the relations in, in those reports, I can calculate the pressure drops. So I'd have about 12 thousandths of an inch of pressure drop in the main branch. And then these other branches, um, this is not physically uh, real that I would have this hub and the one branch would have a different pressure drop than the other branches, but these are not so different. And we'll come back with a second cut just so you see what the real uh, solution would be. But in this first cut, it's fine to have something that's not physically real. Uh, it's close to being real for these flows. And then the associated energy over the lifetime, the costs and the energy costs and the insulation costs and the life cycle costs for each of these branches. Showing us that the life cycle costs for this example would be about $4,000. This is a $2,000 home. Uh, a $200,000 home, $300,000 home. This is roughly what you might expect to pay for the uh, duct work in projects that, that we're associated with. And, um, and this would be um, close to the optimal solution. As we uh, look at a physically real, so going through this analysis and massaging these airflows until all of these pressures at that junction are equal, that is the same pressure to drive airflow through the bigger branch as well as the smaller ones, without any balancing with distributors or grills, I would have about 116 CFM and 46 CFM and if I really did want to adjust these, although this is quite close to being naturally balanced, which is always nice to have, and this duct design um, criterion, this economically optim the optimum design often gives you nicely balanced systems, I find that I'm only $5 difference from that first simple cut. So, so that analysis gets you very close without having to do any sophisticated computations on, on the duct. So that leads to um, how do we know then that a, a system somebody's designed, whether it's yourself or someone else that you're reviewing, or when you get into the field that even though it's a good design, it's been installed in a manner that, um, that's going to perform. And that leads to a field test for looking at duct performance. And, uh, and that's our next discussion topic. So we've designed the duct, somebody's installed it, and hopefully they followed our designs in, and done a good careful job of putting in uh, seam, nice seamless junctions, uh, things that aren't gonna whistle and vibrate and generate noise, as well as uh, leak-free design. And so we've come up with this scale at Build Equinox to, to give you a rough indicator of where a design should fall based on field data that indicates this is going to be uh, an economically optimized system that's also not going to be resistive to flow and cause a lot of energy dollars to be used to, to power that fan. The numbers that you come up with we hope that a duct network has a value of 500 or 1,000, and we'll talk about what these values are, but something we call a C value. Something about 500 is, is a good design. Uh, if you're looking for about 150 CFM, which to us would be the minimum you would want in a fresh air ventilation system. And then ideally, if you can fit in and allow for the future, uh, increase to 300 CFM that you'd be looking at a value greater than a thousand. These tests, an important point, before the wall board goes up, I can't tell you how many in now the few hundred systems that we've been involved in, 
how frequently um, the wall burn goes up and then somebody is trying to figure out why they're not getting the flow through the system. Sometimes ducts aren't connected. Sometimes somebody's done a poor quality installation job. Uh, it's leaky and you're not going to be able to easily get in to take care of it once the wall board goes up. So running this test before that goes up is highly recommended. And then once the test is run, seal up the ductwork before the uh, drywall folks come in and just powder everything uh, all over the place. Uh, you don't want that in your ducts or in your ventilation system. A similar test and a very easy test to run and one that already is being run by many of you is a air leakage test. But we're going to view that in a different manner uh, while there's not really much guidance as we're aware of for what is a good performing ventil ventilation duct system, there is some guidance for duct leakage, but for ventilation systems, these are not good. They're bad. Um, they're too leaky and uh, they need to be revised for ventilation systems. They're really, um, they're really developed for large central air systems that are a couple thousand CFM in size. And so we'll, we'll look at how to scale that more appropriately for ventilation systems. What we're going to use to characterize this is this coefficient we'll call a C value. And you've seen it maybe as a K for those of you more familiar with duct network, but it's nothing more than a constant a factor that relates the airflow to the pressure drop. The pressure drop gets raised to this exponent, uh, but, but really this is nothing more than a relation, a proportionality factor between this pressure drop quantity and the airflow. Now the C value, it is uh, useful for characterizing the flow and something that's important about it is that it is only a function of the duct length and diameter and the properties of air, which as far as we're concerned, as far as air within a residence and the pressure levels that it's operating at, its properties like density and viscosity are, are uh, do not vary significantly. So if I have a duct of a certain length, it has a certain diameter, it has a particular C value, and it doesn't care what the flow is or what the pressure is. So I hook a fan up and I put a pressure gauge and a flow station up and I start running this fan at different levels. I'm going to find that the C value that relates Q to the pressure drop just stays the same. And I can run that experiment in a, in a simple manner with the type of tools that are used for for duct leakage and blower door tests. If I measure the airflow in CFM and I measure the pressure drop in inches of water, even though as an engineer, this is a horrible thing to mix, I get very nice numbers that range from say 100 up to 10,000 over, uh, over the airflow ranges that are of interest to me for residential ventilation. So I'm going to use those because these are the commonly used measurements that people end up with for a home. And if I make a chart up and there's no flow on this chart because as we just mentioned, C value is only a function of length and diameter and air properties. I find this kind of level of C values for these different diameter ducts over these lengths. So when we're looking at the optimal duct, uh, say something that's about 100 feet long with about 150 to 300 CFM of airflow, I would find that the economically optimal duct for those uh, systems will have a C value somewhere, say above uh, six, 700 up to something above 1,000. And if I think in terms of say about 150 CFM, that lower range of, of airflow, where six, seven inch duct 
probably in the range of 60, 80, or 100 feet would be enough for most homes. That 500 would be the C value for a duck that would be in this economically optimum range. It's fuzzy, but mixing the economically optimum characteristics with the airflow ranges that we'd like to see with these C values, this says that trying to keep uh, a duck above 500, and ideally if you can get it above 1,000 without causing too many other headaches or costs in, in, in that duck, that these are good to strive for. Now, we've just been talking about a single length of duck. It turns out that a network of ducks, this network that might be representative of what you might see in a typical home or even more extensive, this has a single C value that will characterize it. The uh, proof for that is in the reports that, that I mentioned, as well as a couple of examples that just shows an overall calculation of a duck network C value. But the more important thing is that when somebody puts a network in the field, rather than going through all the details of their manual D design or some type of calculation spreadsheet, I know that if I hook a fan up with a flow meter and a pressure drop sensor, that even though that C value is not a function of the flow, I can use the flow and the pressure readings to find the C value. I just divide that Q, the flow rate, by the pressure drop, the inches of water to the 0.57 power. And so I can very easily run a field test to get this number once the duct system is put in and balanced. And that duct network, here's a, a test set up from, from, uh, that we put up. This duct below is from our five ton geothermal unit that, that heats and cools our 4,500 square foot building, and we are a net zero solar powered building. Um, and so even though we're a large steel building, uh, Morton type building, uh, we are uh, net zero throughout the year. Our activities, um, our manufacturing and tests are all powered by the sun. This is the test duct though, and we have these different diameter outlets added to it. And these different orifices act as if they are ducts with a certain C value connected to this roughly 30 feet of branch duct, connected with a six inch length of flex duct that goes into a flow station and pressure measurement station, and then hooked up to this fan. And in our test, we used uh, uh, an FE20, an FE30, basically a nominal 200 CFM and a nominal 300 CFM fan, uh, just to demonstrate that the fan you hook up doesn't matter when you're trying to get the C value of a network, that you just need a fan with sufficient flow that's roughly in the range of what you're interested in, um, and then measure the pressure and the flow. The, but for example, this number two orifice, which we, in separate tests, looked at its C value. That's as if, um, if we look over here at roughly 150, that orifice is equivalent to about uh, 60 to 70 feet of duct that's four inches in diameter, or about 20 feet of duct that's three inches in diameter. Um, and so we put those orifices on to act as if they are duct branches connected up. And in some cases we cap off this one or this one. In running through a variety of, of duct openings with different fans, our results, and these data are, are included in, in those duct reports, we find that over a, a broad range of airflow, a broad range of pressure drop based on these orifices we place in different patterns, and, and um, that the C values ranged over a pretty broad range, spanning roughly something that's below our recommended level to something that's, that's fairly nice. And this, this network is all six inch. Uh, eight inch would go significantly higher. 
Uh, and we do have test results from, from other networks in it that go up above 1,000 for, for those of you interested. But uh, this field performance then can be run on any duct system and in calculating that C value or using a chart that we've included in, in these materials, you can look to see just by getting the pressure and the flow rate, whether or not you've got a good C value. And if not, trying to track down where that C value is, uh, uh, where it's being restricted. I do wanna mention that these C values, one of the nice reasons for having that is that if you are maintaining a certain pressure in the duct, the ratio of the C values is the ratio of the airflow. So if I have a C value of 1,000 relative to another duct system that has a C value of 500, at the same pressure maintained in that duct, the C value of 1,000 would have, in this case, 400 CFM versus 200 CFM. And so it, it also gives me a simple way to think about uh, whether I'm getting more or less flow as I open and close dampers or as I increase or decrease the size of a duct in a system. Again, this is roughly the scale. Below 500 is getting quite restrictive and it's going to take a lot of fan power to push air through that network. Above 500 and then especially above 1,000, you're in a really good range for, for moving fresh air. This scale just repeats that with these uh, terrible units of CFM divided by inches of water raised to this exponent. But when that's above 1,000, it's good. When it's below 500, look for ways to increase it. Moving on to duct uh, leakage, and we're getting near the end here, but this, uh, this uh, uh, follows on that uh, quite uh, in a similar manner, that leakage, uh, we're seeing a lot of building codes looking for about three cubic feet of leakage per 100 square feet of house with the duct held at about a tenth of an inch of water, 25 pascals. But the problem is that the average U.S. home is 2,700 square feet. That's 80 CFM of leakage. Well, if we're trying to deliver 150 to, to 300 CFM, this is a huge fraction of the leakage. And it doesn't matter, even though a number of standards allow you to have all the leakage you want inside and not run a leakage test if all your duct stays in your envelope, but the fact of the matter is, if you've got this leakage, you're paying for a lot of air going places where you don't really want it to go. And the whole purpose of ducting is to move air where you would like it to be delivered. Energy Star is a little bit, uh, version three is a bit higher leakage. But this is really a disconnect and this leakage value is really based on something that's more like a 1500 or 3000 CFM uh, central air conditioning system, central furnace system. And the size of the house is really irrelevant. Um, industrial ducts, as I've gotten my uh, HVAC background, uh, we don't size ducts or look at duct leakage based on uh, the size of the building or the industrial process we're interested in. We want that duct as low as possible. And the typical guideline, as ASHRAE recommends, is that no more than 5% of the intended airflow is leaked. And with this 5% leakage rate, by looking at that C value, if we have a C value of 1,000 for the flow performance, this means the C value for leakage should be less than 50. That is, if we cap off the entire uh, duct system, and then put the blower on it, we should have a flow that has a, a C value that's less than 50. So we can run the exact same test as we operated before, and one that is currently run in duct leakage tests, cap off all the outlets, and it's best to do this, um, easiest to do this before you add in the uh, central unit, and just hook a fan up, seal it up, and then 
operate the fan, measure the flow and the pressure as you might do with a duct blaster or other, and then calculate the leakage. And in a similar manner, a chart can be made rather than having to do the computations. And if you find, for example, you have uh, 50 CFM with, uh, with about uh, eight inches of pressure, that then you've got a C value of 60 and you're in a pretty reasonable range. Ideally, getting below 50 or 40 would indicate that with a C value for flow performance of 1,000, you only have 5% duct leakage. And a similar scale, but the opposite, the bigger the duct leakage C value gets, the, uh, the poorer it is, and the lower it gets, the better it is, with roughly somewhere in the 50 range for C values of 500 to 1,000, indicating you've got less than 10% or 5% leakage. So uh, to summarize, the two aspects of this talk on economic optimization, is there's a lot of computations and analysis to derive that duct diameter. But as you saw in that chart, it gives some very, uh, uh, very simple to use information on uh, relative to a certain amount of airflow, what the duct, optimal duct diameter should be and that that is independent of the length of the duct. So you can go branch to branch and where you would like to have a certain amount of flow, you can determine what diameter uh, range is best used for that. And then a key result or finding of that is that duct velocities for these ventilation ducts should be somewhere in the three to 400 feet per minute range, maybe four to 500, but ideally, do your best to try to get it in this range. You'll keep noise down, you'll keep callbacks and complaints down, and you'll have an economically optimized system. And then designing an optimal duct, designing a very good duct, doesn't ensure that it gets installed in that manner. Out in the field then to look at flow performance, the C value, can be determined with very simple tests, both for flow performance and leakage. And we hope that if you do try these, please give us a call, contact us, and share your results with us. We hope to document this based on more and more field studies and then to generate a report so that we can all see what is actually happening in the field um, and, uh, and then share that information among, among others. Well, thank you very much again for attending. Um, please feel free to ask any questions and, um, and we'll do our best to answer those. Hey, thanks, Pat. Yeah, we got a, a few questions here and we definitely got time for some more questions. Uh, real quick, huge thanks to um, all of you for attending, our board of directors, our volunteers, uh, and a big thanks to our top tier sponsors, Shrinergy on the go or in your house or small business backup solar power uh, energy for when uh, uh, the grid fails uh, and then T stud the most energy efficient wall stud assembly out there uh, insulated studs and then Mitsubishi uh, ducted and duct free uh, single family through uh, commercial high rise uh, all electric heat pump systems uh, that you got to check out. Um, so yeah, Ty, there is a question here that I think goes back to um, maybe one of your first original slides. It was way back in the beginning, and I was just trying to find a good place to interject it. But um, the question or the, the, the two questions kind of merged together was, explain two tons of air, please. Uh, two tons of cooling worth as in 400 CFM a ton or 800 CFM. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, tons are just as bad of units as uh, the CFM per inches of pressure drop. But um, nominal rule of thumb uh, is about, say, 400 CFM per ton of airflow. And uh, so in ventilation systems where, uh, in our case with the serve, we're running about a third of a ton, but the serves design and performance at a third of a ton is really about the tonnage that's needed to heat or cool ventilation air 
as well as to exchange energy between incoming and outgoing airstreams. Uh, but for comfort conditioning, whether in say a ductless system like the Mitsubishi Hyperd or a ducted system that you would typically blow about 400 CFM through for a ton. Now a ton of air conditioning, that harkens back to those days of 1913, 1914, as um, Willis Carrier and Frederick Busey were looking at central systems in residences for heating, and then later on in the 20s and 30s for air conditioning. And a ton of air conditioning is basically the amount of ice that you would need in a 24 hour period, the tons of ice to keep a building comfortable. And on campus at the University of Illinois, we have uh, the very first research house in the US, at least as far as we're aware of, that was built back in that era of the 1930s, where the coal chute would have blocks of ice shoved in it. They would blow air over the blocks of ice to keep the house uh, cool. And it would take, uh, this was an insulated house, which was unusual at that time. This would take about, um, uh, three, four, five tons of ice per day to keep that house cool. Now there's an energy amount associated with a ton of ice and, uh, and that's basically 12,000 BTUs per hour times 24 hours. That's the amount of BTUs that, um, that are absorbed in melting uh, a ton of ice over a 24 hour period. And for those of you that think more in terms of kilowatts instead of BTUs per hour, about a ton is about uh, three kilowatts of uh, heating or cooling capacity. The airflow that goes with that ton is also the basis of optimizations done within companies like Mitsubishi and, and, uh, and other HVAC companies. That's roughly where the temperature change of the air as it moves through either a heater or a, or a set of cooling coils where it changes enough that you're going to get the heat delivered, but it doesn't change so much that you get to say excessively high temperatures or you start uh, degrading the performance of the unit. So while you would like to try to blow as little air through that heating or cooling coil as possible, the temperature changes uh, on a practical basis, as well as the efficiency changes of that heat pump or furnace, that those changes are such that roughly about 400 CFM is where it seems to be the economically optimal spot for the design of those units. And hopefully I've kind of hit the mark, but please feel free to ask again if that's uh, not the answer to the question you were. Wani. Thanks, Ty. Um, so another question is, it seems that considering you are proposing that we should be looking into 200 or 300 CFM ventilation, and that with many HRV or ERVs on the market only producing that 200 to 300 CFM at their max, that we would need to be running these units at their max all the time. Yes? Uh, no. So this is where smart ventilation comes in. So you need that capability to deliver that amount of air when there's that level of occupancy. So as we were mentioning um, uh, earlier on that we need about 40 CFM per person in that building or house when they're in the building. And when they're not in it, we don't need it. So, uh, so a house that might have uh, five people in it for a period of time, maybe some friends come over, uh, but there's five people in it. Yes, you do need uh, 200 CFM of air being blown through it in that, uh, in that house while it's occupied, but then they all leave. Now you don't need any ven ventilation air. And this is where smart ventilation really picks up uh, a large level of efficiency over uh, what we call one and done, but, but steady uh, once through ventilation. And so while yes, you can make ASHRAE 62.2, uh, 
And that will be an airflow that, say, for a 2,000 square foot home with three bedrooms, might have about 60, 80 CFM. When you have uh, a larger number of folks in it, or uh, if you think about taking that 60, 80 CFM and dividing that among six different areas of the house, now you've got 10 CFM in that bedroom that you're sleeping in, or um, and that's not sufficient. And so yes, these airflows need to be increased, but just increase when you're there. If you're there 24 seven, yes, it will be running uh, with that level of occupancy uh, at that rate, but you need it to run at that rate. And when you're not there, um, yeah, you hardly need anything. Uh, and so that's why, um, that's why it's so important we start making use of today's technology to automate it and put it in the background so you're not continuously wondering whether you need to put that dial on number eight or number six or number four. Thanks, Ty. Um, the next question is, the two field tests seem to have different locations for flow meter relative to fan and pressure sensor. Is that correct? Uh, no. I, that's, uh, thank you for pointing that out. That's just my uh, uh, poor schematics. But th it, So exactly the same test, let's say you hook up like a, a duct blaster or something like that to do a leakage test. Uh, it would just be set up in the same configuration, then uncover all the duct outlets, run that test again, and get the airflow and uh, the uh, inches of pressure, um, and then do that C value computation or go to that C value chart to see what it is on the performance side relative to the leakage side. But yeah, no, uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, change that in. Uh, for future presentation slides. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, it seems like the earlier slides pointed to larger ducts based on 300 CFM and uh, LCC, uh, but then the later slides about velocity pointed to smaller ducts. Am I understanding this correctly? Uh, no. Uh, 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 yes. Um, you'll do fine with 150 right now for most homes. Uh, a serve, um, the serve two, for example, can run up above 300, but 300 we have is its nominal high airflow rate if the ducts are designed appropriately, so they don't have excessive pressure drop. Uh, so within, you know, within the conditions we were just discussing, but generally uh, uh, for most homes right now, running that at say 200 CFM or 150 CFM does just fine. When a house is populated, it's got more enough airflow so that if it hits the CO2 or VOC threshold, it will uh, maintain it below that threshold. And then at unoccupied times, um, as it's going through assessment or its various recirculation modes, uh, filtering out particulates and, and evening out comfort through the house, that that's enough airflow without being say adding the additional power at 300 cfm because we really would like to try to run as low of an airflow as we might be able to but we just see where things are going just based on the reports that just continue coming out on how poor air quality really has impacted our our health within buildings and so 150 is okay to design to and uh, but as much as we can get people to start thinking about designing the 300, we'd like them to do that. I hope that hits that. But uh, so uh, in the example though, where I was looking at say 50 CFM, 100, and then 300, you know, when you get into branch systems, your branches are all going to have a variety from say maybe 20 CFM. Uh, up to the main branch, 150, 300 CFM uh, flows through it. And so you'll have a variety in any, um, any network of ducts. Great, thanks. Um, well, I don't see any other questions um, and we're a little bit over now. So I guess just real quick, um, can you reiterate where people can find uh, 
more information, some of those studies you mentioned. And then I also really like the idea that you're inviting us to um, kind of do our own studies and, and send them your way. So uh, if someone wanted to contact you to learn a little bit more about that, um, you know, where can they do that? Yeah, they can uh, get that contact on our website, but um, uh, but I'm just on this last slide, Ty at buildequinox.com. And uh, yeah, for sure, we'd uh, like to hear from you. And, and if you already have data like that, we'd be glad to work with you on uh, translating it into these terms. And if you're getting ready to run some tests, and in the meantime, you know, a number of the projects we're involved in around the country, uh, we're trying to get more of this data so we can do a follow-up to uh, show what we're seeing in the field. And, um, and, and hopefully we get this, what's often left as kind of a not so important aspect of house design, get that elevated right up there with, uh, with window design and, uh, and, and wall, wall construction design. Great. Well, I really appreciate your time uh, joining us today, and um, we're going to head off now, so take care. Uh, have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Happy Halloween there. Bye-bye. Yeah. yeah thanks. <laughs>